Uh, thanks everybody for joining us today. Thanks, Mike, for the uh, great uh, introduction. Um, so I was asked to give a, a presentation on uh, the unilateral, unilateral or uniportal uh, approach, uh, and specifically for thoracic discectomy. And honestly, you know, um, thoracic disc herniation treatment is so for anybody who is not confident that endoscopy is here to stay. I would say this pathology is the biggest reason why I think uh, spine surgeons should learn endoscopy because uh, it is going to be, in my opinion, the gold standard at some point, at least for the initial attempt uh, for all thoracic discs. So um, here are my uh, disclosures. Um, so I, am a, I teach for Joymax and I have a teaching agreement with Globus. The one that's relevant for this is, is Joymax. Um, and as you all know, there's many other vendors. So, uh, and I tried to be as agnostic as possible. Um, so just like Mike was talking about, there are multiple types of endoscopy. What I'm going to be talking about today is the uniportal uh, full endoscopy, uh, and more specifically to treat uh, thoracic discs. Um, so these are the two different approaches, interlaminar and transferaminal. Mike went through those uh, very uh, well. Um, so today I'm going to be talking about specifically the transferaminal approach. Um, and this is just an example of what it looks like when you're holding the endoscope. So this is just a video of the chief resident doing an interlaminar case. So you see you have your left hand is maneuvering the working channel and the scope, and your right hand is going in and out uh, uh, with whatever you're using. So in this case, it's a drill, and you see there's screens all about around the room. So it's a very ergonomic uh, type procedure once you get comfortable doing it. So I just wanted to kind of show the setup for people that haven't uh, seen this before. Uh, but again, this is the interlaminar, but if not transferaminal, like what we do for a thoracic disc. Um, so, you know, we went over this a little bit in the first talk. So does endoscopy work for me? There's a steep learning curve. We're treating conditions that already have pretty good outcomes. Um, there's a decrease in productivity initially, and there's a cost. Uh, but to, to all those, my answer is definitely it's, it's, it's worth going through all these and pushing through uh, for your patients. And what are specifically, like when I sit down, I'm like, what is, why is endoscopy good? And to me, the number one thing is the thoracic disc uh, treatment. It is game changing. Um, and associated with that is utilization of the transferaminal route. The transferaminal route is, is, a, um, is a path to the spine that's very difficult to do without the endoscope because of the size um, of the endoscope being small enough to fit into the foramen and also because of the angled nature of the scope. So you really can't do it with a microscope. It's, it's very, very difficult to, to, to do that without some type of endoscope. Um, and then secondary, you know, there's less nerve irritate retraction, especially when you're taking a disc herniation, let's say in the lumbar spine from uh, a transferaminal route, you definitely don't have to retract on dura like you usually do for a typical micro disc. Uh, disc. Um, there's less soft tissue manipulation, there's less bony removal to get to the lesion. It gets really, it's almost the gold, um, the gold standard, any type of surgery that you want. Cause really, if there's a way that we could like radiate the lesion and not make a skin incision at all and not mess with any bone or ligaments or, or any type of, um, of, the, of any part of the joint, that is the gold standard. And this is the closest we have to that. The third thing here is, is the irrigation. These are all under, these procedures are done under constant irrigation and the irrigation acts like a humongous retractor for the dura. Um, so, you know, it's much harder, at least in my opinion, to get a durotomy because you have direct visualization because your eyes are at the level of the lesion rather than far away at the endoscope. Um, and you have the irrigation to push the dura away and create um, uh, barriers there between you and uh, the, the dura uh, and inadvertently biting the nerve uh, or nerve sleeve. Um, so, yeah, so irrigation it helps with durotomies. Uh, with patients with large BMI, because you are, your eyes are at the level of the lesion, it doesn't matter if your patient is a BMI of 60 or a BMI of 10. Um, and there's a study recently that was published that showed that the only difference between large BMI patients and uh, low BMI patients in endoscopy is the positioning time. Other than that, it's all exactly the same because it's the exact same surgery. Once you're in there, it's all the same. And the infection risk is zero because of the irrigation. Um, so as you can see here, the number one reason why I think you should learn endoscopy is for thoracic discs, and that's what we're going to be talking about today. So this is a patient um, that came uh, to me with symptoms of thoracic myelopathy, so problems with ambulation and balance, um, was seen by neurology, had every other 
potential lesion or potential um, uh, disease ruled out. So even though this is a smaller disc and maybe not causing the problem, uh, all uh, the signs pointed towards this being the offending agent. Um, and this to me was one of the first thoracic discs that I took out. Um, so for this patient here on exam, had myelopathy signs, was a hyperreflexic. So I talked to him about traditional approaches versus endoscopic, and, and he decided to proceed with endoscopy. Um, and you know now, you know as I've gotten a lot more comfortable, all these patients, I give them a shot with the endoscope because worst case scenario, you you know core this thing out and either it devascularizes and dies over time or it makes your open approach easier because it gives you the space to mallet uh, your, your offending or the, the disc into uh, the cavity that you created with the endoscope. So either way, it works best to start with endoscopy in these cases, in my opinion. So this is a, a, a setup in the room. So the starting point for um, the, the, for the starting these transpyramidal approaches in the thoracic spine is where the rib starts to curve. So I just feel the patient's rib and where it starts to curve, that's immediately medial to that is my starting point. These incisions are tiny, they're six, seven millimeters. Um, and uh, after you do that, you utilize a, a jam sheeting needle to access your foramen. You can use navigation if you'd like, and navigation, to, in my opinion, uh, really makes the learning curve a lot less steep. Uh, because you don't have to, you're not like plunging into many different areas. You're going right at the foramen that you are looking for, but it's not something that you have to have here. We just used a traditional uh, O-arm spin with the perk pin uh, and utilize the Medtronic um, uh, net navigated jam sheety uh, needle. So what are we aiming for when we're getting into uh, the canal? So I always, for these patients, I always mark them with cement before surgery, and then I get an MRI after the cement. It makes it a lot easier to count during the surgery, and it minimizes the chances of getting a wrong level surgery. So this cement here was done uh, before the procedure, and then I got an MRI, and I looked at the MRI and said, okay, the disc is the level below the cement, and that's what we're aiming for here. And this is kind of the final position that you want to be in for your uh, instruments uh, in, the, in this transferaminal approach. Um, so even though it's called transferaminal, it's really more of a trans superior articulating process approach because you're going through the SAP, you're going through that cost of retrieval junction to get to this point. And the final point that you want to get your jam sheety to is the on the AP to the mid pedicle line, as you can see here. So it's a mid pedicle line. And then on the lateral, you want to be just immediately posterior to the PLL. So you want to be immediately posterior to your um, uh, uh, PLL, as you can see here. And that really should get your scope when you come in to be at a, at a perfect position. Um, so you put the jam sheet in, you put a K-wire in there, and after you get the K-wire in, then you start using your dilators and your different size reamers. So the system that I use, it starts with a smaller reamer, then it gets to the middle one, then it gets to the big one, and you sequentially go through that. And once you go through with the largest reamer, then you could put your uh, working channel in. So you see the working channel here is exactly where we want it to be. It's a mid pedicle line. Uh, and you're in the foramen. So this is a great place to start uh, doing the procedure. So I have a video here that I'd like to show. Um, let's see, it's gonna be a, a, a quick video uh, and I'm gonna kind of scroll through it. So now this is, you know, you've, you put your working channel in and you put your scope in and what do you see? So when you come in, you initially see your, um, and this is a video by John Ugalade at uh, WashU, great video. And he has great videos usually. Um, so this is on the right side here is the pedicle, and then it goes up into the superior articulating process. And the thing is, you see the reamed bone there. So the reaming not only helps with expanding your foramen and doing your foraminoplasty, it also helps you when you come in, you're like, oh, that's the reamed bone. I know where I am here. So that's the principal anatomic landmark. You want to see the SAP uh, pedicle junction. And then you get this is a bipolar uh, instrument, so you're just kind of coagulating everything in there. Um, and slowly over time, you're going to see that the fecal sac will come into your field. Uh, you expand the foramen a little bit more. Uh, so it just depends on what pathology you're looking for. Sometimes just reaming gets you what you need, but sometimes I'd say most of the time you wanna drill uh, your uh, further on the SAP and on the pedicle. And then you also want to drill into the vertebral body, especially if the disc is calcified, just like how you do this with the open surgery, you create a little uh, a pocket or a little window underneath the, the disc and then you flick the disc down into, um, uh, into the cavity that you created. So just kind of fast forwarding here more. So now you start seeing the dura there. 
you're using this bipolar to, to get a good plane between your dura, which is super flattened here, and the offending agent, which is the disc. Uh, and that's another nice thing about endoscopy. You could use that bipolar coagulation to, to create planes or to find planes in areas that you don't. Um, so you see here, John is drilling into the vertebral body a little bit, again, to create a little pocket to flick the disc into. And I'm just gonna kind of go forward here so you could see hey, later. So this is, he's grabbing the disc uh, uh, and flicking it into the pocket that he created. And as you slowly over time, you'll see that the dura will expand um, and everything uh, will be a lot more free. So um, you could do all this through, again, six, seven millimeter incision, super minimally invasive, especially compared to the typical procedures, which would be either a thoracotomy or some type of transpedicular uh, or, or costal transversectomy. So you see now you see the dura really well here, um, and he's getting just the last couple pieces of disc uh, before calling it calling it a day. And, and you see all these instruments, some of them are more curved than others. Your endoscope is also uh, has an angle. It's going to be between you know 20 to 35 degrees, depending on what scope and what company you're using. So I thought this is just a, a great video uh, to showcase um, you know this this the specifics of this procedure. So now you you kind of debulked it. You could take some x-rays to check that you got what you're looking for. So you could see in this first picture here, this is a drill. We're kind of on the lateral extent there. That's where we're starting to drill our trough into the, the, um, uh, into the bone uh, to, to create a little opening to flick the disc into. The second picture shows uh, our Hartman or pituitary across midline. And we know this is a midline disc. So once you cross the midline, then you know that you're good. Uh, and then this the last two pictures, there's a bipolar picture showing um, how far down and how far up you go. So you really could get all the way across to the other side, depending on how much drilling you've done for the in the foramen uh, and how much you've expanded the foramen. And this is a post-op scan that shows how much bone was reamed or drilled. Um, and you see it's right here. Like it's very, very minimal on the sagittal uh, scan. Uh, and then on the AP or in the, um, on the axial, you see that there's a lot more of the joint that was taken up. So through the six millimeter incision, you got this disc out and the patient went home uh, the next day. This is a post-op scan uh, showing that the disc is gone. So it's really a, a really nice result. And after you get used to this and you get comfortable with doing these smaller discs, then you can go for things that are more intense or more, more crazier cases, I guess. And this is an example here. This all here is a humongous disc herniation. That's not cord. At first I thought it was cord. The cord is actually flattened all the way on the contralateral uh, lamina and facet joint. Um, and this is, again, did the same thing. You, I marked the patient, got an MRI post-marking to make sure I'm doing surgery at the correct level. And then this is a post-op scan showing a, a beautiful decompression of the cord. And you see how smashed the cord was uh, because you see the T2 change uh, in the cord after the decompression. Um, and again, six millimeter incision, went home the next day. Um, and, uh, you know, honestly, after you get used to this, that these patients go home the same day now. I don't keep them overnight. I used to keep them overnight just to get these scans. But now that after, you know, now after I'm, I'm pretty comfortable with uh, what decompression you can get. I've been sending them home the same day. So what are some risks that are inherent to endoscopic spine surgery? Uh, these are all types of procedures, not just the thoracic discs, but you can have seizures, uh, headaches because of the increased pressure from the water. You can have neck pain. And the one that you worry about, especially when you're doing thoracic cases or cervical cases, and, and, which, and, and uh, that's the reason why most people say start with lumbar cases until you get super comfortable and then move up to the cervical and thoracic, uh, but the water pressure is important. So for, um, you know, for thoracic or cervical cases, you always, like for me, at least I lower the water pressure to the least amount of possible. Uh, and, and the way that I gauge that is I want to make sure that when I'm like a arm's length or half arm's length off the patient, that there's nothing dripping out of the endoscope. And then I slowly go up uh, to the limit, which is, uh, you know, the, the diastolic pressure of the patient. But if you start really low and really be meticulous with keeping your pressures low, I haven't had a problem with, uh, you know, with a cord injury from the water pressure. Um, derotomies are extremely difficult to close primarily or impossible. Sometimes you could put a second port and close them. Uh, but in my opinion, the dead space is so little that if you just do an on layer and an inlay um, and uh, some type of glue, it's way more than good enough. I have not had any problems with uh, derotomies that have come back for need a second procedure. Uh, and I think, again, it's just a small dead space. So um, I have had a lot of derotomies, no question about it, especially when you're in the learning curve, but they never caused a problem post-op uh, yet, thankfully. Um, and then intraoperable bleeding, you know, that's why you go up with the pressure or the water. You start really low and when things get really bloody in there, then, you know, 
as a last ditch effort, you have to increase your water pressure. There are other things that you could do as in uh, putting TXA or epinephrine in the irrigation, um, having thrombin on the field or having some type of surge flow in the field. But this is one of the challenges of, of inherent uh, endoscopic spine surgery that I think as you get better at and you become more meticulous with what you're doing, um, uh, you decrease the risks of. So this is a paper that is in revision. It's from the endoscopic research uh, uh, um, study group, uh, or sorry, endoscopic spine research group. Is, I wrote that wrong there. Um, so uh, it's a group of people around the country that do uh, endoscopic spine surgery. I think Ray Gardaki, I saw him in the participant, so he's one of the prominent members there. Um, so this is a paper that is not published yet, and these are just a couple things that I wanted to show from thoracic disc. So this is a meta-analysis of all um, of multiple papers in the literature that dealt with thoracic disc through our traditional methods, meaning thoracotomies or posterior uh, fusion procedures. Um, with costal transversectomies or transpedicular approaches and compared it to a retrospective case series from multiple institutions around uh, the country, including uh, here at uh, U of M. And what you can see, there's 30% of these patients that are not even getting general anesthesia compared to 100% for traditional methods. Uh, times for surgery are about the same, blood loss way less in endoscopic surgery, as you can see, five, you know, comparing it to about half a liter. Complications are half, three operations are about the same. So this risk profile favors endoscopic so much. Uh, and then you look at this other table here, and again, these numbers might be not the final numbers, we'll see what the publication shows, uh, but, but yeah, I think these are gonna be the numbers that come up in the final publication. Uh, but you see that 60 something percent of these patients are done as outpatient, where 100% of traditional are done as inpatient. And then the length of stay is drastically different. And this number is so important because when you're going to your hospital and you're telling them, you know, I need an endosc endoscopic tower, this is data that you could use to, to prove that point. This is better for my patients based on the first table. Uh, and then it helps the hospital out because you have a decreased length of stay. So why should you take this on? It completes you as a spine surgeon. It allows for the least invasive option for your patients. You always wanna do what's best for your patients. Um, and this is clearly better for your patients that have thoracic discs. Um, it opens up opportunities for young surgeons beyond their years of experience. So it makes you prominent in your community or in your hospital because you have a skill that not, not, uh, it's not as widespread yet. Maybe one day it will be about widespread and I think it will, but for now it definitely opens up opportunities for young surgeons that are beyond their years. And it allows you to enter this international community of, of phenomenal people and endoscopic spine surgeons uh, that we you know, all are, are learning from one another to improve this field and make it uh, safer and better for our patients. So how do you start? Mike went over this. I'm not really gonna, uh, gonna, gonna harp on this, but you know, explore your different vendors, go to courses or do a fellowship. I was fortunate enough to do uh, my fellowship at, at Washington and it was a phenomenal time, but not everybody has the luxury uh, to, to take time off and do that. Start with straightforward cases, give yourself lots of time, get connected to other surgeons at different stages of the learning curve. And honestly, get ready for an, an exhilarating ride. It's been a phenomenal process, and, and I recommend it to, to anybody for sure. So thank you all uh, for listening to me, and I'll have I'll take questions at the end after uh, the last talk. Osama, thank you uh, very much for taking the time to do that, and uh, thanks a lot for doing all these endoscopic cases over the last few years. It's been really fun watching you uh, develop as a endoscopic surgeon. Uh, it's been awesome, so uh, thank you very much. Our uh, next and last speaker is going to be uh, uh, Ankit Mehta. Ankit's going to talk about um, uh, dual portal uh, endoscopic approach. Um, so Ankit, thank you very much for taking the time to give this talk. Sincerely appreciate it. Okay, thank you, Rock, for uh, setting this up. And 